think with Keith, what's really interesting and what makes him kind of takes him to the next level as a leader is that he is so invested in creating more transformational leaders and creating this, you know, multiplier effect, so to speak, of um, taking all of his experience, other people's experience um, from different amazing leaders in his network and using that to change the whole world through, you know, millions and millions of other transformational leaders. Hello, I'm Viva Bianca, and today I have the honor of speaking with Keith Crack. Going back to an earlier time in your life when you were a kid, who or what did you want to be when you grew up? Well, when I was really little, I would tell everybody, I can't decide whether I want to be a truck driver or the Pope. Now, now that was because my favorite uncle just told me to say that. And then I kind of got realistic. I want to be a professional football player. Uh, it would have been good to be Aussie rules football. But um, I, I think really it evolved to, I wanted to be like my father um, because uh, he was always just so kind and so humble and he was super funny and everybody just loved him. And um, I remember uh, one day we were driving in the factory and uh, uh, he wasn't, uh, you know, he wasn't a real bear huggy kind of guy. He was a German guy. And, and uh, I said, Dad, just everybody loves you, you know. Why? What's the secret to that? And he just took the car, just pulled in a Burger King parking lot, put the brake on, and he just looks at me and he goes, when you're with the Pope, you pray. When you're with a drunkard, you drink. Everything in between goes, but always be yourself and never lose your integrity. And that was really a valuable lesson. I mean, it was teaching me the importance of range and respecting uh, different temperaments, talents, and convictions, but always stay true to yourself. And I read that your first job very early on was a, a welder in your dad's machine shop. Is that right? That, yeah. Well, that, what was that like? Well, that is right. I was working in uh, my dad's five-person uh, machine shop. Actually, the first job was cleaning the sinks, cleaning the toilets. You know, then I worked up to being a welder, and then I worked up to uh, working on the machines. It was a great experience for so many different reasons. Um, and I learned so many different things. I mean, the first thing that I learned was a good work ethic and, uh, um, and also understanding what things are like on, uh, on the factory floor. And, and also there were plenty of opportunities actually to do little innovations because it was all about how fast could you make all these uh, parts. Um, and uh, I also learned what it's like during tough times because this um, machine shop, the big, uh, the big customers were the automotive companies and when their business went down, ours just went absolutely flat. And I remember uh, a year where it was just my dad and me, we were the only uh, employees and to watch um, how tough that is, but also to watch um, his, his resiliency um, in, in terms of that. And I also could see uh, in this environment why people loved uh, working for him because he just had an amazing self-deprecating sense of humor. He used to call, mock yourself out. And he, always, and he was a boxer in the army and he would say, Keith, you ever, you ever get in a situation where um, you just feel like there's no way out? And I'm going, Dad, what are you talking about? What are you talking He goes, like you're a boxer and you're just getting pummeled in, you know, in, a, in the corner of the ring. I go, yeah, I've had, you know, you get that warm feeling inside. He goes, yeah. He goes, you know, there's one way out. I go, what are you talking about, Dad? He goes, no, there's one that works every time. I go, I go what is it? He goes, mock yourself out. He goes, that, that gets you out every time. And he said, um, and, he, and he goes, and that's funny. He goes, but don't mock other people out. Uh, that's, not, that's not funny. Plus you can hurt their feelings. <laughs> How do I meet your dad? He sounds amazing. <laughs> I want your dad. Oh, he's great. <laughs> and speaking of fatherhood, I'm aware that you've been a pretty ins inspirational father yourself and that 
you and your son founded Venture Academy. And I understand this was during a, a pretty transformational year that you took with your son. Yeah. Can you talk a bit about the adventures you went on and, and Venture Academy itself? Yeah. So, um, you know, uh, this was kind of, uh, I came up with this idea right after uh, running hard for seven years at, uh, at Ariba. And um, I, call, I call Steve, my son, the, the Hail Mary catch because we were, and he was, you know, 12, 13. And at that age, they want to hang with their dad. And I'm like, oh, hey, I got to go out of town, all that stuff. And um, he was uh, an average student. He was an average athlete. Uh, and he didn't have a lot of self-confidence. Um, but I could see he had much more, uh, you know, much greater potential. And he was really young for his uh, grade. Mm -hmm. So I just came up with this uh, crazy scheme. I figured, hey, well, if we're challenging the status quo in business, why not just do it, you know, with the family? And so I said, you know what I do? I pull him out of school for a year and take him around the world and uh, give him a chance to catch up. And then, then he can enter into high school with all the guys that like he's playing baseball with that are his age. And then I figured that the only way to have him do that is we've got, I, mean, I gotta get one of his buddies. And there was another guy who was, uh, played baseball on his team, you know, Little League, uh, who was also young for his grade. And uh, thankfully, uh, his parents were open to it. So I approached him and I said, hey, what do you think about pulling these guys out, you know? for a year. And uh, so they went along with it. So then I go to the principal, I said, hey, um, we're gonna pull them out for you. They go, you can't do that. It's a truancy thing. I go, well, who can I talk to? And I said, well, the superintendent. The next thing you know, I'm talking to the state and they said, uh, well, you know, if there is some kind of, you know, school, home school or something. I go, oh yeah, no, I have a school for them. It's Venture Academy. They go, oh really, tell me about it. I go, I just made it up right now. And so what it was all about was um, growing uh, these two young uh, guys uh, spiritually, physically, and intellectually. And I got their favorite teacher to be their academic sponsor who would give them homework assignments. And we kicked it off with first, the, the first trip was in Africa for a month. And we climbed, climbed Mount Kilimanjaro, it was the hardest thing ever done and wow. we went on a safari and then um, you know they would come back for a week and their academic sponsor would say well you've got to do a PowerPoint presentation to my you know my eighth grade class all of them because I have to teach five classes a day so should you and by the way you don't know anything unless you can teach it and then we go off and we do survival training in the Amazon you know rainforest build houses for habit, habitat for humanity I took them over uh, I was doing a, a bunch of business over in Japan. You could see that. We took them to Europe. We went scuba diving in the Great uh, Barrier Reef. And it was an uh, amazing experience. They would write a journal every day. They had to learn 50 words in every single language wherever they were at. Um, and, um, uh, you know, and I could see these two young men transform before my very eyes. And I'll never forget, um, you know, and I decided to kick it off with a big bang. Let's climb Mount Kilimanjaro. And, and later on, we, uh, we went, we climbed peaks in Ecuador, which was a lot. I mean, that was really, really tough. And as we were going, climbing up Kilimanjaro, there was the biggest fire in, uh, forest fire in Kilimanjaro history. And we were right at the point. And I mean, seven porters died, not ours, but I mean, like, on, uh, on this trip and we had to like run through the fire break. I mean, it, it was, I mean, we could have died. But anyway, we made it to the top, we're coming down and you just see scorched earth everywhere. And one of, the, one of Steve's assignments was to write what it was like to climb or not to climb Kilimanjaro because you don't choose the mountain, the mountain chooses you. And, um, and I said, well, Steve, what are you going to write about? He goes, I'm not exactly sure, but maybe something like this. Uh, after this, I'm never going to complain about any sports practice or any homework again, as long as I live. 
And so um, I could see him transform. Now, his, his one buddy ended up being a, a professional uh, pitcher for the Cleveland Indians, and now he's in the enterprise software business. And my, my son's a spacecraft design engineer at NASA doing a robot arm for Mars 2020. And what was interesting is, as those guys got transformed, I got transformed too. I mean, there was a lot of adventure stuff where I was pure t terrified and petrified, but um, that built a bond that will always be there. So, uh, you know, I, I explained to people, I go, that is insane. It was one of the coolest things I've done in my life. And do you imagine your son's life may have gone in a different direction had oh, he not yeah. taken that year? Yeah, and when, and when those guys came back, they um, th they had confidence for sure, but they had the deepest humility. And what was always interesting for me is, you know, um, he'd be with some of his other buddies. They're going, oh, we're going to this faraway place. And he just said, oh, boy, that's interesting. It was, you know, it was a place he had been before. And he, but, you know, he never really, uh, you know, bragged about it. Mm -hmm. But it was, it was life-changing, and he's just a great, uh, humble spacecraft design engineer, rocket scientist. So. No big deal. <laughs>